November 2011. That was when I resigned from my full-time job working for the Philippines' largest television network so I could return to Cavite and prepare for the big move. And this big move was to Singapore. I resigned from my full-time job, everything that was comfortable and, and lovely working in Quezon City. And here I was in my living room in Cavite thinking about, like, what am I doing? Is this a big mistake? Welcome to Are You Local? In this episode, I'll be talking about why I left it all behind me and moved to Singapore 10 years ago. I can't believe it's been 10 years since. If you haven't yet, please consider following my podcast here. Um, you could use, uh, This is shared on popular streaming platforms. Thank you in advance for clicking follow. Why did I move to Singapore? I wanted to move to Singapore because I wanted to pursue opportunity. Most of the regional offices of the world's biggest broadcasters have their office here. So in March 2012, I moved here with that in mind. I wanted to work. Having come from the Philippines' largest broadcaster, I knew next to level up for me was to work to become a producer for a television network that was in Singapore. One of the companies in mind was, you know, the largest um, TV network in Singapore. And I always had this and this funny thing that I envisioned myself wearing, you know, the lanyard of this particular company. I just manifested it in my head like, I want that lanyard. <laughs> it's unbelievable to think that it was that manifestation at the time and I actually got the job. It's crazy. Um, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. When I first arrived in Singapore, it took me about three months to finally find a job here. How was it like during those first few days? I could say it was very humbling. Going from the airport, so there's three of us, myself, my then partner, and also our graphic designer. We, three of us were pursuing, you know, looking for opportunities in Singapore. So from the airport, we, I remember we, we didn't take taxis. We would, um, t- <laughs> This is embarrassing. We would take our big luggage, um, haul them onto a bus, a bus, and make our way to Lavender. And Lavender is a part of Singapore, the Lavender MRT. It's just at the city fringe, and we would stay at a backpackers hostel. And the staff was Filipino, and that's where we would live for three months. And day in, day out, living in a backpacker hostel meant that we did not have our own rooms. We would share them with other backpackers visiting. So I remember during that time, we met everyone. Everyone, uh, you know, when you're in a hostel, you know, a backpacker place, a backpackers inn or or hostel, you meet all sorts of people inside. Um, we met people from the Netherlands, from Mexico. Um, we met people who were in town, you know, as as tourists. We met people as well looking for jobs. So you met. It was very colorful living in that backpacker hostel, and it would be probably my favorite experience. In the first few days, the first few months of living in Singapore, because here we are, here we are, um, like living out of our luggage, literally living out of our luggage. How we found a job? Um, so I moved to Singapore in with the intent to work for local, you know, local either our local broadcaster or the regional headquarters of like a, a global broadcaster, which I'll get to in a minute. And what did I do? Um, I applied online, of course, during the time. Um, one of us, the three, one, the three of us, right? One did walk, did walk-ins, and I can't believe, you know, you could do walk-ins in this day and age. Uh, and then we also attended like these job street, um, job fairs during the time. I'm not sure they had those prior to the pandemic, but ten years ago, you know, job street, they would have, they would get like, you know, the SunTech Convention Center would have like a job fair. And mind you, these jobs would be from all walks. Like you'd have jobs, you know, in hospitality, in aviation, um, administrative jobs. And you would rarely find a job in, let's say, a field that I was pursuing, which is, you know, to continue my my career in, in the media. But yeah, we still attended these. We would buy the Straits Times newspaper and the Sunday edition specifically because that's where they would have classifieds and we'd really literally circle job openings that we would see. And it took me three months, three months. The challenges at the time included, you know, we were on a tourist visa and um, while I was using my American passport and my companions were using their Filipino passport. So they only had 30 days make or break. Well, I had three months to make or break. 
for me it was much more comfortable for my two companions it wasn't so they had to exit Singapore maybe go I forgot where they went <laughs> I think one went to Indonesia the other went to Cambodia but they would have to fly back to Singapore after five or six days that's not definitely not encouraged um, you know that's sort of like um, skirt skirting the rules but of course we were so adamant on pursuing these opportunities to live and work in the Lion City that you know nothing was gonna stop us I landed a few a series of interviews and copywriting tests with a local broadcaster and luckily that was a very straightforward um, path for me and I landed my first job within those three months first three months working in Singapore I didn't need to exit the country and come back that wasn't a problem and my companions also got their first few jobs one got to work for a production agency yeah both of them got to work for two separate production agencies during those first three months uh, moving to Singapore I think the most important thing was to save money uh, again at the time I had left my full-time job and I was living off of my you know, what we call racket you know, I was living off of money that I had earned um, in addition you know, as a graphic as a graphic designer as a video editor and I remember saving we would not splurge at restaurants at all we would eat what we you call here in Singapore mixed vegetable rice so this would so if you're in a hawker center or a coffee shop a coffee shop in Singapore by the way is like those food food corners with like the different food stalls of different like Chinese food um, Indian food you know that kind of thing so we would always eat mixed veg rice and this I think in the Philippines the equivalent and you can correct me if I'm wrong here is the turo turo which means that you, you just get in the queue and you have all this um, cheaper um, costing food in front of you and that was what we ate every day to the point that I've never you know I stopped every time I I'm at a hawker center before the pandemic I would refuse to eat mixed veg rice because it just brings you back to that you know during that time um, this would be like at the time it would probably be like three four dollars which is very cheap and but tasty it's pretty tasty anyway to eat mixed veg rice but we would eat that and even more memorable was I, I won't forget this it was McDonald's we would only eat McDonald's on our third or fourth week can you imagine that we would also be on a diet of like old chanky and old chanky is like your you know like your what do you call this uh, fried dumplings on a stick uh, your sotong head you know the really um, street food the street food equivalent in Singapore it was important to save money during those first few months because it was make or break at the time Plus, living in a hostel was, um, although we were living in a backpacker hostel, people normally stay at these places for maybe three weeks, two weeks. We were staying there for three months, and we were paying the equivalent of rent, of um, renting a room, you know, an HDB. And in Singapore, only people who have a work pass are allowed to rent uh, an HDB. Uh, if you are on a tourist visa, you should be staying in a hotel, or staying with friends maybe, or in a hostel. I remember the joy I felt when I first uh, when I got when my first work pass was approved. So in Singapore, even if you um, go through the whole process of applying for a job, um, going to a series of interviews, uh, at the end of the day, if the government does not approve your work pass, then it's nothing. <laughs> it's useless, and so it's always like you have to jump through multiple hoops to get to where you want to be. So I wouldn't. I never forgot that day that my work pass was first approved uh, that meant that you know in your work pass it could be valid for you know 12 months 24 months 36 months and I got a two-year work visa at the very beginning and that was essentially converting your tourist visa to something that you know you could stay in Singapore and start setting your roots a little bit and once we got that um, the three of us my, me and my two companions we got our work passes more or less around the same time. The next step was to immediately move to find a place outside of the backpacker hostel to rent. And we found a place all the way up in UT, which is super far. That's almost like Malaysia. And from UT, that's where we lived for those initial first few months. Right, 10 years later, four companies, eight neighborhoods that I've lived in. And I ask myself 10 years later right now, was it worth it? And I'll tell you, yes every bit about the past 10 years was worth it leaving everything behind all the comforts that i had in Quezon city in the philippines i felt like you know i was really drawn to this infographic that said 
the magic happens outside of the comfort zone. I remember I saved that on my phone and true enough, it's what happened. It's only when I left my comfort zone that I started to accomplish the things that I wanted to accomplish for myself. Some tips I have would be make sure that you have a plan. You don't just do something and you know, uh, without thinking about it really carefully first. You have to make sure you have a plan before your first move. And that means you've already done your own assessment and you're, take, and you're acknowledging that you are taking a calculated risk with what you're planning to do. So before, prior to moving to Singapore 10 years ago, I made sure that you know I had a list in mind of companies that I wanted to apply at. I already found you know researched well about where I could stay, which backpacker hostels I could stay, how much money I would you know need to budget in order to survive day to day. That's not a joke, especially in one of the world's most expensive cities. So I made sure I had a plan. You need to make sure you have a plan before you make your move. Tip number two, make sure you have a backup plan. You can't just have a plan and expect that to materialize. Of course, you know, along the way, something will happen. You know, you get robbed. That's not going to happen in Singapore. But let's just say you lose your money or something happens like you're what happens if you don't find you know secure a job within your first 30 days your first 90 days here what are you going to do you need to come up with plan b plan c plan d my family my friends my partner they all know that i'm a big planner so i made sure that when i moved to singapore i had some you know some things that i could fall back on like what would happen if i you know did not get a job where would i go um, what, what, what do I need to do? Where can I get money if I needed to get money last minute? I even went to the point of researching about um, remittances and you know the other way around like my family sending a remittance to me um, Yeah, those are the things that I thought about in the beginning So that's my second tip. It's to make sure you have a backup plan My third tip is open yourself up to possibilities and exploration so while I came to Singapore with a particular set of companies in mind uh, and you know in the beginning I was probably a bit conservative like I'm happy to apply to five companies each day you know it reached the point three weeks late in my first three weeks that you know it doesn't matter just apply just send you know apply for the telecom Singtel Starhub uh, consider different you know avenues you know you never know what you could land or what opportunity what you know what employers are looking for maybe some are looking for like uh, transferable skills so never limit yourself you should be open to different possibilities my fourth tip is not more so in the very beginning but something you know in terms of how you you know move to a new place um, and you, you've probably heard about this in my past episodes here on this podcast but the fourth tip is to make friends it's important to build your network and of course that's that's probably one of the most obvious ones when I say make friends this means once you you know move to a country when I was in that backpacker hostel um, I'm a bit introverted but I made sure you know had keep um, have conversations with people that you meet add them on Facebook maybe later on LinkedIn um, that's building your network um, through the years the past 10 years in Singapore one of my favorite experiences here is joining a dragon boat team and immediately once you join a dragon boat team you're you, you know a dragon boat team there's 22 people on a boat on a standard boat um, and that's just one boat um, your network just multiplies you meet teachers nurses engineers aircraft mechanics um, it's 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 incredible the community you can build by um, and the friends that you make by joining a sports teams such as that and the reason I mentioned is when you need help um, later on if, if you know you have a support system that you're building around you because you're moving to a brand new place so my fourth tip is to make friends my fifth tip is probably the opposite of that it's to lear learn to let go of old friends and I think and that's something that I've, I've come to terms with uh, here in my mid-30s is that you have to learn to let go of old friends perhaps friendships that were built based on proximity or of the such you know just because you know you all know each other from a certain period of your life maybe you know they've changed you've changed or you know um it's you know it's not necessary it's not necessarily you know key to you know stay in touch with people that don't share the same values as you do um you know 
it's not about making the most friends it's about keeping the friends that really matter and that is something that's universal um, wherever you go especially when you move to a new country and you build uh, your network and you make new friends it makes you evaluate uh, what really matters to you my sixth tip is to stay in touch with family and people that matter so that means you know you're going to be moving to a new country so it would be great to you know find a way to update family i especially need to update my mom um during this pandemic it's almost every day but uh it's important to you know keep in touch with family and the people that matter my seventh tip is to give back and also to learn how to integrate so apart from joining a dragon boat team uh, i say if you're moving to a new country you find a way to contribute to a certain cause in that country uh, here in singapore i'm passionate about lgbtq rights um, however you know due to restrictions i'm not supposed to be too vocal on that since i'm a foreigner here instead i, I i'm able to give back in different ways like by volunteering for an organization like action for aids singapore um, I used to volunteer for them a few, a few years ago. So yeah, find a way to give back and integrate. Those are my tips for moving to a new country. Uh, probably get more specific in an, an, an upcoming in an upcoming series of episodes I'm planning to do with um, Filipinos who have moved to Singapore. That's going to be a separate edition of Are You Local? The title question of this podcast, Are You Local? I can't feel local since it's a government policy to distinguish local versus foreigner in this country no matter what i've been in singapore for 10 years i love it so much my experience here and i know i've i've done my part in contributing to the country and you know promoting it as well and no matter how much i love singapore um 10 years later it's you know it's every day in day out even the way that they count the with cases or the pandemic you can still see that you know they separate you know foreigners from locals and i'm sorry what i meant by that is that the imported cases and the and people in the dormitories and from the local community cases there's always this uh, clean fine distinction my only comment about that is that i understand of course coming from the point of view of uh, people who are who are from singapore who live in singapore who are cit singaporean citizens of course this is their country uh that's always that's my personal opinion there it's you know to respect that uh, as a as a resident here for the past 10 years i've i feel like i've done my part um i continue to do my part um and that's what matters to me as long as i'm doing that uh, of course if there are better ways to find um you know great stories of integration between the two i'm all for that and that's what this podcast is also about i can say that i'm part uh, the, the past 10 years i'm i'm glad that i have been um part of singapore's story from 2012 to 2022 and that it singapore has been part of my own story the past 10 years it's contributed to my career after four companies 10 years you know i've grown professionally i've ticked almost every box that i've wanted to tick i've learned i picked up sports i picked up dragon boating i learned you know i, I enjoy running but for me the definition of local is being in a place that embraces you for everything that you are and you know that's something i'm hoping to achieve by speaking with different people on this podcast to understand how they're integrating in their part of the world the final question is was it selfish to resign from my full-time job in the philippines to pursue my dreams here uh, you're gonna hear this a lot but People move to different countries, obviously, for different reasons. Uh, different um, people need to support their family. People need to pursue, you know, some career aspiration of a sort. I belong in that other, you know, the, the latter. Uh, moving to Singapore was always a personal. It was more of a career-driven um, initiative. It wasn't about family. My family's uh, were privileged in the sense that we could take, take care of ourselves. My parents, my brother, you know, um, they're doing fine in the Philippines. So moving here, you know, I was afforded. Uh, I was afforded that privilege to move here and pursue my career and knowing that my backup plan would have been return to the Philippines or move to the United States or pursue an opportunity in another city like Hong Kong, London, New York. Um, there, you know, Singapore is always, you know, it's my choice. It remains my choice up to today, up to 10 years. It was not a selfish move on me, for me to move, to leave it all behind and move to Singapore. I hope you enjoyed the tips I provided in this episode. These are based on my own personal account, having moved here 10 years ago. I'm planning to be more specific in future episodes as to, you know, the 
job hunting process to find you know finding a place to live in or joining a dragon boat team i'm going to be more specific i'll have special episodes for those featuring you know relevant guests um thank you so much for listening to today's episode and happy holidays